Okay, any questions? Well, this, this fact of measurement is probably the weirdest aspect of quantum mechanics. So classically, there is no equivalent concept. Classically, whether you make a measurement or not, it doesn't influence the outcome. But quantum mechanics tells us that the act of measuring itself changes your system. Yes, any questions on this? Okay. So let's talk, talk about averages now. Now, how many of you are uh, considering to do experimental work? Okay, for example, when you actually do a measurement, what you will see, let's say you are measuring some property. This is the observable. It's the number of count of outcomes. So let's say you are measuring something that is supposed to have this value. Or you don't know the value to start with. So you just make the measurement. Most of your measurements have this value. So these are the number of measurements. You just repeatedly measure the same thing over and over again. You create identical systems. Uh, you measure that, that property of that system over and over and over, most of them will give you this value. Well, some of them will give you a slightly larger value, some of them slightly smaller value, some of them will even give you larger values, some of them will even give you smaller values. Okay, this is probably oversimplified version. But basically, you will get such a measurement. And if you would just fit some function on this measurement, well, that function will look something like this. Let me use a different color. It might be because the identical system that you created might have slight variations. It might be because your uh, measuring device is not precise. It might be because, I don't know, when you are making the measurement, your friend just put your, his tea mug on the uh, table, but you will not get a single value, you will get a spread of values. And well, sometimes this spread will be large, sometimes it will be small, depending on the quality of your measuring equipment and the property that you will be measuring. And then you say that, okay, if when you look at this, these measurements, you will say that this is the value of your outcome, this is the average, observable, let's call it O. This is the average of O, and more or less, this is what you call the uncertainty. That width is what you call the uncertainty. So the, your measurement basically tells you that this, ob, uh, this observable has the value, the average plus minus sigma. Again, as I said, this is an oversimplified version. Now, the average of the observable is defined as the value multiplied with the probability of value. Now, this definition of the average, we use it exactly in this form, also in quantum mechanics. So let's see, we, we said that Sx plus state was 1 over square root of 2 plus plus minus. If you 
prepare a pure ensemble and then make the uh, Z component of spin, well, half of your measurements more or less will give you uh, a plus h bar over 2, half of your measurements will give you a minus h bar over 2. So the average of Sx in this state, which we also denote as Sx, or SZ in this state, we are measuring. We have an SX plus state, we are measuring the Z component of spin. This is 1 over 2 times, or let me write it in this form. I can have the value H bar over 2, with a probability of 1 over 2, or I can have the value minus h bar over 2 with a probability of 1 over 2. And this will be 0. That is for this state. If you have a, a Sx plus state, the average of F, Sz is 0. This one. Here. Why we have this one and this one? Well, uh, you, may, you are talking about this one. This is equal to 1 over square root of 2 plus minus minus h bar over 2. This is not even a number. Well, you see, in general, let's say we have a state alpha. And we want to find the average of the ob some observable O for this state. And then this state, this observable O, well, we know that we can talk about the eigenkets of this observable. Let's call them alpha i, so that O alpha i will be equal to alpha i times alpha i. Now this, we will also denote by either O or if you want to emphasize the state, we will put the subscript alpha. Just the notations we will use. Now this alpha state, I can write is as a superposition of alpha i a i. Now the average of O, the observable, I would rather define it as the possible outcome. For example, alpha i is a possible outcome. What is the probability of this outcome? Ai squared. Let me rewrite this, alpha i. Well, Ai is nothing but alpha i alpha. Because these alpha i kets are orthonormal. Or let me just use maybe a different symbol over here. I'm summing over all j, all states. Well, let me take one more step. This is alpha j. alpha, alpha j, alpha j, alpha. Well, the alpha bra is independent of my summation index. Alpha ket is also independent of my summation index. So I can just take them out.
But this is nothing but my operator O. So basically I have proven that the average of any operator in a given pure state, at least, can always be written as this matrix element. Now, one thing that you should note over here, for example, we were looking at the average of Sz in the Sx plus state. Now, the possible outcomes of Sz is plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2. But in this state, the average turned out to be 0. 0 is not a possible outcome. But never, so you need to make this distinction. The averages need not be equal to an eigenvalue. So in this case, whatever you state you consider, the average of Sz will be some number between plus h bar over 2 and minus h bar over 2. Yeah, of course, the measurement itself, I mean, classically, you can also make measurements. But measurement itself changes the state. So classically speaking, you can determine, for example, the Z component of a given system with, I mean, by uh, improving uh, technology. I mean, your devices might become uh, better and better. So this spread over here, sigma, can get smaller and smaller just by improving your uh, measuring device. Quantum mechanics tells us that no matter what you do with your measuring device, that will never change. There is a limit to the uncertainty. Basically because depending on your state, Sz itself doesn't have a value. In this state, Sz doesn't have a predefined value. It can have two different outcomes. And these, this, these two different outcomes is not due to the uh, lack of precision of your measurement, measuring device. It is due to the state itself. That's the main difference. So if, as long as you create this Sx plus state, your measuring device will always have this spread. On top of this quantum uncertainty, let's say, there will of course be the uncertainty of your device, due to your device. But that will be on top of the quantum uncertainty, which is independent of your measuring apparatus. We will, we will see the uncertainty relation, why we have that uncertainty relation. Now basically, this, <coughs> this uncertainty <coughs> is a property of wave mechanics. Well, before going that, let's look at the <coughs> compatible and incompatible observables.
Now, what we mean by compatible and incompatible observables, let's say we have <coughs> an observable A and another observable B. Now, in a measuring measurement, <coughs> what we expect is you measure a property of the system, and then once you measure it, right after that, you, make, you measure exactly the same property of the same system. And you would expect the two measurements to agree. So that's why we basically have this phenomenon of collapse. That's what we observe. You just make two successive measurements of the same thing. In that time, nothing changes. You measure exactly the same thing. Okay. okay. So, <coughs> but let's say that you make a measurement A. You get the outcome A. And then you make the measurement B right after that you get the outcome B. Right after this B, you again make the measurement of A. You see, just imagine that you are making three measurements, right after one right after the other one in the sequence. The result is definitely A with 100%. If this is the case, If this is the case, whatever A and B are, that tells me that A and B are compatible observables. So this is the definition of compatible observables. So we just make two different, you first determine, let's say, you, you could have uh, just did it the other way around. You first measure B you obtain B, then you measure A, you obtain A, and right after that, if you make the measurement of B and you obtain B with 100% probability, this is our definition of uh, uh, compatible observable. So it, it doesn't really matter which order you make these experiments, you can just repeat them one after the other one. But of course, this tells me that after all these measurements, I obtain states that have definite values of A and B. The states have, I can just label them with these values, A and B. I act on this state with A, I get A times AB, I act on the same state with B, I get B times AB. Now for compatible observables, I can talk about both of those properties at the same time. It's not like SZ and SX, for example. We had seen that we cannot really say that a given state has S is SX plus and SZ minus. We cannot say that. Because if we do this a sequence of observables, changing the order in which we are carrying the observable changes the result. But what does this tell me? Let me just act on this states A, B with the product of them. Now this will be equal to A times B, A, B which is, B is just a number, A acting on AB, which is just B, A, A, B. Well, small a and B, they are just numbers. They are the outcomes. So I can just change their places. This is equal to A times B acting on AB. A is just a number. This is equal to B times A acting on AB. But this tells me that since this should be true for any operator, any kit that have definite eigenvalues, well, first of all, we start with saying that we can talk about 
cats that have definite eigenvalues because changing the order of A, A and B experimentation doesn't change the result. So I can say that the states have definite value of A and a definite value of B. So these are physical states that I can create. Well, the, uh, all of the states I can write as these states, as physical states in terms of a summation over physical states. So any ket I can write as a superposition of these A, B kets. Since this equality is true for the basis kets, it should be true for any operate any linear sum of these basis kets. But since this identity is true for any linear sum, it is true for any ket. But that basically tells me that A B should be equal to B A. Or the commutator of A and B, it should be equal to zero. So this tells me that compatible observ uh, operators corresponding to compatible observables, they commute with each other. Another way of stating this, I can diagonalize A and B at the same time. It's the more familiar uh, expression. Now we could have started from the commutator and say that we could diagonalize A and B at the same time. Let's see. Claim. If equal to zero, A and B can be simultaneously diagonalized. Now, let's start with the simple case. A has the eigenkets alpha i and no degeneracy. Let's look at this one. Well, this should be zero to start with because the commutator is zero. That is our starting assumption. But this is equal to alpha j a b minus b a alpha i. This is the definition of the commutator. This is equal to alpha j a dagger b alpha i minus alpha j b a dagger no not a dagger a alpha i a dagger is equal to a they are observable so they need to be hermitian the reason why i use the dagger notation is the dagger acts on alpha j the bra so this uh, this is equal to alpha j alpha j b alpha i minus alpha i alpha j b alpha i. This is equal to alpha j minus alpha i. What I did over here from this line to the last one is just I acted on the alpha i and alpha j with the operator a. Since alpha i are the eigenkets a acting on them just gives me the same bra or ket multiplied with a number. And I also use the fact that the Hermitian operator has eigenvalues that are real. This should be zero. Well, this tells me that if alpha j and alpha i are different, then this matrix element is zero. Now we are first considering the non-degenerate case. So these, these, uh, so this tells me that if alpha i is 
equal to alpha j, that is the only non-zero case, then alpha i ket is equal to the alpha j ket. But then this is the corresponding matrix element. But since the alpha i ket and the alpha j ket are equal, well, let me put it this way, i is not equal to j. If the eigenvalues are different, then the corresponding kets should be different. Since we are looking at the non-degenerate case, so that tells me that alpha i b, no, alpha j b alpha i is proportional to Kronecker delta i j. But that tells me that the, at least in the matrix representation, only the diagonal entries of b are non-zero. So you see, what we did was, we only diagonalized A. I didn't diagonalize B. But if A and B commute, then the basis that diagonalizes A automatically diagonalizes B. This is the non-degenerate case. But even in the degenerate case, only the matrix elements of B corresponding to kets that have the same eigenvalue can be non-zero. It doesn't have to be diagonal completely, but it can be blocked as what we call the block diagonal. One example, angular moment. Okay, we will study the angular momentum later on in more detail. L squared and Lx, they commute. Or no, let, let's say Lz and M. L squared and Lz, they commute. So if I diagonalize one, the other one is auto the other one uh, can be diagonalized, might not be diagonalized. But what we know is. If you write the L squared operator in matrix form, well, there are the L is equal to zero states. There is one of them. It is diagonal. It's a one by one matrix. Then the L is equal to one term. It's, a, it's also diagonal. This is a three by three matrix. L is equal to two states, five by five states. And usually we choose a basis in which Lz is also <coughs> diagonal. So this is zero, all these are zeros. Here I will have a three by three term, let me multiply by h bar, plus one, zero, minus one, plus two, plus one, zero, uh, minus one, minus two. These are also zeros. So Lz is diagonal. But L squared and Lx also commutes. Now, Lx matrix in this basis that I used over here will have this form. Again, it's 0 over here. It will have, here we have a 0, 0, 0. I'm just making up the numbers. I don't remember the numbers now, let's say. Uh, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. It's not diagonal. I'm, I have diagonalized L squared. Lx is not diagonal because there is degeneracy. But nevertheless, now these states, they all have L is equal to 1. They correspond to the same eigenvalue of L squared. Matrix elements of Lx between those states are non-zero, can be non-zero. But for example, if you look at some state over here, which corresponds to, let's say, L is equal to uh, 5 on one side, this matrix element, and L is equal to 1 on this side, well, they, these two, the rows and the columns, they correspond to these different eigenvalues of L squared. So the matrix element of Lx is 0. So this is what this, OK, we already know that if there is no degeneracy, if you diagonalize one uh, of the commuting operators, the other one is automatically diagonalized. But if, they are, if there is degeneracy, 
if you diagonalize one of the operators, the other operator is not completely diagonalized, but it, it takes a block diagonal form. So the other matrix becomes uh, zeros on blocks, non-zero on blocks that are on the diagonal, and they are all zero out of those blocks, just like this elix operator over here. I have these one by one block over here, three by three block over, over here, five by five block over here. These blocks will be non-zero, all the others will be zero. So that's what we call a block diagonal matrix. So this is what we mean by uh, what we have for compatible observables. Now let's look at the incompatible observables. Now any questions on these compatible observables? Well, when we study the angular momentum, this example will probably become more clear for you also. You see, in these compatible observables, we can definitely say what the outcome of the, exp of the successive experiments are once we determine the eigenvalues of A and B. So we can definitely say that once we measure A once and B once, we can definitely say what our third measurement will be, whether we measure the A or the B. That is for sure. There is no uncertainty there, besides the uh, technical uh, limitations of our experiment. There is no quantum uncertainty. But for incompatible observables, this will be non-zero. They will not commute. And hence, we cannot diagonalize them simultaneously. Because you see, if we could diagonalize them simultaneously, here we have that the proof that if we have, if we can talk about these kets A and B, that are the eigenkets of A and B at the same time, and they form a basis, that is, we already diagonalized A and B matrices, for those kets in such a system, A and B have to commute. If we can diagonalize them simultaneously, they have to commute, there is no alternative. If they don't commute, like in this one, then we cannot diagonalize them at the same time. Which basically means that it will make a difference uh, in which order we make a major one. Do you first measure A, do you first measure B, it will change the result. If you make measure A and then measure A, you will get the same value. If you first measure A, then measure B, and then measure A right after the other one, then you will get a different value. Then, of course, how much these errors change, these values change. Suppose you create a state, <coughs> and you see, before we could talk about states that had definite values of A and B. For incompatible observables, we cannot talk about such states. But we can talk, ask this question. Suppose we create a pure ensemble made up of some states alpha. And in this pure ex ensemble, we ch try to measure A and B separately. We divide it into two. In half of them, we measure the A. In half of them, we measure the B. Both A will have some error. There will be a major quantum uncertainty in the value of A, unless the alpha state is a pure state as an eigenvalue, and there will be an uncertainty in delta B. So how are they related? We, we first said that we cannot make both of them zero. If we could create common eigenkets of A and B, then we know the value of A definitely, there is no uncertainty in A. We know the value of B definitely, there is no uncertainty in B. So delta A and delta B will both be zero, so their product will be zero. But if they are not compatible observables, if they are incompatible observables, we cannot make both of them zero simultaneously, 
except that maybe some special cases. And we will also see what those special cases are. Now on Wednesday, we will find the limit of this. So that will basically uh, bring us to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yes, any last questions? Okay, so see you on Wednesday.